31st of May and we were out again. It is about quarter past five in the evening, uh, p.m. So that's about uh, 17 hours and let's say 40 minutes into the day. Uh, it's an approximation. Well, I'd say maybe 20 hours, in, uh, 20 minutes into the day. Not exactly past 5:30. The last time I checked the clock, uh, it was uh, 5:08. So, give myself 15 minutes to get out. across Well, you can't look forward, you can always look backwards. And this is the case of who knew what, when, and who was Voltaire. And the reality is that Voltaire was, although he was significant in atheism and philosophy, he wasn't significant in science. That was Leibniz, Newton, and actually even Descartes. And the one you want to put in front of Voltaire and in front of everybody that sort of caps off the call uh, quantum physics is Planck. Because Einstein did his work based on what Planck's work. So you have a continuous line from Planck all the way uh, through quantum mechanics and into uh, superstring theory. Beginning with Planck, so you could connect Newton, Leibniz, and then Planck. And what happens is that Voltaire sits somewhere in the middle. Voltaire was not Voltaire was not a scientist. He used math, he was able to read the stuff, but he wasn't a scientist. So he didn't do any of the work. What he did is he in his plays he <laughs> retold the stories and reinterpreted things like like Einstein. <laughs> and reinterpretation is not doing science. It's not the research that's done. And see, LeBron does the same thing. He doesn't actually go into science at all. He's got a bit of science, but he doesn't actually, he doesn't actually go into it. He's, he's not a researcher. And this is what puts him back into the realm of the conspiracy theorists. And the uh, conspiracy theorist loves to learn new things. And has a curiosity. Uh, and so does the intellectual. But the intellectual is not a scientist, they're not a researcher. And so this place is a, the intellectual, Ryan LeBron, and the folks like that, uh, with Voltaire, as, uh, as people who pretend they learn, who take their knowledge, and use it as their badge of authority their sort of symbol of power.
And I find that a lot of the debunkers, so now you got to classify debunkers as conspiracy theorists, but it's once again looking into the background, doing the background research into debunkers. You find they're not actually scientists. They're not actually doing research. And so what happens is that this is the same thing with your administrators like Fauci. Fauci's not a researcher. He's not a doctor. He's got a title. He went through the beginning part to get the MD. But he is not. He's, he's never been in clinical practice. So his knowledge is very minute. He's been an administrator all his life. But this is most of so-called top doctors are simply administrators. And so they don't know specifically what they're doing, but they have to pretend like they do. And this is what causes a large chunk of the problem. You've got a lot of people... You have a lot of people pretending to do things in order to be something that they're not completely. And not, it's not that there is a complete sense of knowledge for anything. But this is the problem. Well, well this is part of the problem is that... that or, 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 or is that people pretend as if there is a finite solution to things. And there isn't. There isn't a finite knowledge. Knowledge is always infinite. And you're always learning. You're always growing if, if you're learning. As soon as you close your mind off and say, I am the expert, you're no longer learning. And this is what intellectuals don't understand, is that they don't understand that as soon as they turn their mind off, as, they, as soon as they say, I am the greatest, listen to me, they've turned their mind off and they've stopped learning. That's the point they've stopped learning. Stop learning. Stop learning. For a person like myself, who's a library rat and a research rat, lab rat, research rat, uh, that's a really wrong way, library rat, uh, lab rat. We're always learning, and this, this and it actually it, it forms part of our, if you will, for the nerdy part, our, it forms part of our social dysfunction. We are socially dysfunctional people. difficult thing to realize that, that, you know, being a nerd is part of the social dysfunction and it's, what, and it, it, it's the thing that isolates you from society, from people. Lyle LeBron hates everybody, but yet he's invited into society. Uh, for myself, I don't mind being with people. But I'm not invited. And that's largely largest chunk of it has to do with my nerdiness. That's my social dysfunction. And it's always been like second uh, common courtesy so we have our discussions heavy stuff while we do the mundane riding and the, the safety uh, issues I'm not gonna go too fast
share the road. That's the thing. It doesn't take long to do that, to, to be courteous. above everybody else if you think that you're the best person out there. And everybody else is stupid. Well, you're not going to have that nice of a life. I mean, I, I, I'm socially isolated, but I still have a good time. I've got my anime, I've got my cartoons, I've got my little vlogs I watch. I'm a YouTuber, I'm not necessarily an influencer, but... Uh, I just wouldn't call myself an influencer. I'm getting there, but uh, on Instagram, I mean, I'm a, classified as a micro influencer. Uh, continue on with our discussion, our conversation, the thing that comes to mind, the term that comes to mind, is something called ponderances. Ponderances are the... The thoughts that tend to linger. In other words, thoughts kind of don't simply come into the mind and go again. Uh, but they come in, they stay, and they're thought about for a while. And they can be reoccurring. And this happens as you sort of make a sort of call cross-reference to a number of different things that, that you've experienced. The thoughts that you put into your library are certainly of this category. And this is where we talk about uh, Lion LeBron is to get in connection with uh, Voltaire in his in the situation that he is describing in terms of his pundits, he sort of ignores and doesn't bring and doesn't bring Dostoevsky and he should. And so the ponderance becomes, as you're thinking about things, is you want to just behave you. And part of his, 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 on a regular, almost on a regular basis, I would say, he is concerned with the definition of things. Concerned with the proper terminology, punctuation, and so on, so on, so forth. In other words, it's a continuous thought. Now the question here is, is that in reading you'll come across many different writing styles. Not just the, what we'll call the standard uh, school book 
or school approved uh, formats. And one of these older writers who uses a variety of different formats, and actually I say uses a format that I'm pretty sure LeBron, as he of Lionel Nation, uh, does not talk about LeBron James, the best basketball player, but Lionel LeBron, the lawyer, the intellectual. Uh, he's always about punctuation and proper sentence structure. And yet, there's an author called James Joyce who completely flaunts the rules and does an old style of English writing uh, when there is where there are there is no punctuation at all. So the question is, what would <laughs> Lionel LeBron think of James Joyce? In terms of the writing, in terms of the writing style. Now I'm of no particular rule or respect, so I just didn't, you know, I didn't care for what James Joyce, uh, James Joyce wrote, and his writing style was, you know, it wasn't amusing. You can find styles, you can find uh, a number of different things about writings and so on and so forth, sayings, amusing, of interest. But the thing is that I could find nothing of this within James Joyce. Yet I came across it as people were assigned for their English classes, their English literature classes, to read James Joyce. And the thing is, this is what brings <laughs> the second Croft reference to mind goes back to uh, uh, Rodney Dangerfield, one of the older forms of comics, who is now deceased. He plays a billionaire, uh, Carnegie Mellon, of, of, of the Carnegie Mellon thing. Uh, who ends up going back to college with his college-age son. Of course, this guy is used to having everything being bought and paid for. He's very wealthy. He's a billionaire. So he's assigned to do a paper written about uh, on, on works done by uh, Kurt Vonnegut. So who does he get to do the paper on Kurt on this book done by Kurt Vonnegut. Well, he's able, he's got enough money, enough uh, sort of influence, he gets Kurt Vonnegut to write the paper. What does Kurt Vonnegut get on the paper with the name Rodney Dangerfield on there? And then, why? Because the teacher didn't feel that he appropriately captured the essence of Kurt Vonnegut within the, within the, the novel. And this was, this was something actually written by uh, Kurt Vonnegut himself. So this is this, this was, although this was not known to the professor, what Roddy Dangerfield handed, handed in as his own assignment in English was basically a critique of Kurt Vonnegut and his, his works done by by Kurt Vonnegut. It was a self it was a self critique. There's no way a self critique could, could ever be wrong because you're simply criticizing yourself. But yeah, the English professor was not aware of this, and in her own her own sense of called hubris, the pride, and her status and position, sought to correct what she thought was the wrong ideas. And there's one of the, the phrases in the line, you see Kurt Vonnegut walking, looking at the F that he got from the professor, wondering how he could have gone so wrong. <laughs> And this is, this is kind of what you sort of see in Roddy Danger, uh, in, in Milo LeBron, is that he's the professor. And what he says goes. He 
he is a person of stature, a person of pretense. And his sense of right and wrong is the standard by everything uh, is the standard by which everything must be measured. But yet he's in a quandary right now, and this is where a large chunk of the 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 sort of the unease and discomfort comes from. He is finding things terribly wrong as he's moving further to the right. And is he's, he's being pushed to the right not because he's being pulled into a, a group or a cult. But because he finds the attitudes on the left so repulsive, some of the, this includes uh, open sexuality, including children, he finds it repulsive. And so the thing is, is he, is he, he has got no children of his own, and yeah, he finds this repulsive. But the problem is, if you took a position of moral, moral relativity, and he has you now sit in a position of contradiction. Because the person cannot have relative morality and then say that something is wrong at the same time. And this is the problem, you know, this is what's happening in the United States. Well, this is the end of modernism. The end point of modernism, because modernism removes God, it's humanism. And God was the cause for morality. Without God, there is no cause for morality. Man is not fundamentally moral. He's simply left to his own devices. It's not that man couldn't be moral in terms of the, of the species. It's not that man couldn't be moral. But left to his own devices, man is typically not moral. We, because, and that's just because, because we're typically selfish. We think in our own interests. We do not consider the interests and the concerns of others. We consider everything from our own perspective. And this creates an issue. And as what happens, as this is what, this is how sort of connection to Voltaire, this is the process of Voltaire. The Voltaire wasn't a scientist. All the scientists, Newton, Leibniz, Planck, all had a belief in God. The, the group that says science is above all and there's no God is without science.